All right, well, we're going to talk about iterative versus incremental development today. Let me make share my screen. All right, here we go. All right, hopefully everybody can see the screen now. Yep. All right, cool. So before we get in, I'm just going to do a really quick bio for myself so you have some idea of who this person is who's talking about this subject. So when I started my career uh, out of college, I started out as a developer and started out on IBM mid-range, AS400, System 36, uh, old, very old school green screen programming, and then later moved into, into Windows desktop development and finally moved moved into, into application development on the web. And then after that, yeah, I made the ma move to management, the dreaded manager. So for nine years, I managed a software development team, about 25 people, designers, developers, testers, product owners, release management engineers for a small company, about uh, a little over 100 people. And because it was a small company, it was privately held. The, the owners of the company really didn't buy into, into the role of Scrum Master. So I pivoted and for the last three and a half years I've been a scrum master so here I am never looked back so that's a little bit about me professionally something fun that you probably don't know about me personally is I'm a bit of a super fan of the 80s hair band called striper so I used to have a a very glorious mullet back in the day I had nice long hair in the back no pictures I'm going to share here but they are to be found somewhere yeah, so I've seen the band 13 times live. These are all pictures from shows that I've attended. So you can see lots of lots of lights, lots of soaring guitar solos. Um, so you kind of get the vibe back in the MTV days when MTV actually showed actually showed videos. Headbangers Ball was a show that I had to get back um, on Saturday night in time to watch. So I've met the band on three different occasions. No, I don't have them on speed dial. No, they have no clue who I am, but I have met them three times. And here's some pictures with me with the band. So that's a little bit about me personally, something fun. But let's get back to our topic, iterative versus incremental development. So these are two well, uh, very well and commonly known strategies in in software development. I'm sure most of you have heard of both of them, but quite few, quite many times you, they'll be, you'll hear them confused. So what are they and what are the differences between the two? So I want to switch gears here and take a poll. So hopefully you can see this Menti poll that's here. So you can either take out your camera on your phone and you can use the QR code there or you can just go to menti.com and enter that eight digit code. And I'm gonna advance the screen and the menti code is gonna be on the following screen. I'll, maybe I'll give you just a second if you wanna. It's also in chat. On your phone. Thanks, Jane. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that are there, so what word or words, you can use multiple words, how would you describe incremental development? We'll wait for some responses to, so go ahead and and add your options there, your choices there. And I'm pretty sure as soon as someone enters, it will show a word cloud. I don't know if it's user error on my part, but I'm, yeah, somebody else just put it in the chat. Yeah. I'm just seeing like a thumbs up when I go to that first screen. Yeah, so do I. Yeah, thanks, Jill. Uh, yes, uh, Mark, that's that's what I see too. It's not progressing further. Okay. There no, it's, it's oh. not. Yep, now it just went. Okay, I think I actually had to present. There we go. Okay, so what word or words best describe incremental? So I see small, 
increases piecewise. What else? One step at a time, little bits at a time. Mm, so several people are putting planned addition, not fully completed. Ooh, small functioning slices. Addition. Say slices again, planned, small chunks. Continuous. All right, so 30 responses. Thank y'all. Okay, so that's incremental. So now let's contrast that with iterative. So what word or words describe iterative to you? Continuous, build upon, repeat, evolving. Enhance, buildable. Small changes, feedback based, interesting. Short cycles, okay. Adapt. Repeat, evolving, recurring. Cycles, phases. All right. Y'all doing very well. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do this. So thank you for those. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through the two approaches and I'm going to first talk about incremental approaches and see how that may be the same or may be different from what some of you thought there. So when we talk about an incremental approach, it really calls for first having a fully formed idea and then building upon that idea bit by bit over time using smaller packets. We call them increments. Some people may call them sprints of end to end functionality. So the analogy to think about is think about a brick wall and you got individual bricks and you're putting those bricks together, brick by brick by brick by brick. And before you know it, one little brick turns into this big brick wall. That's the idea that we have for an, an incremental approach. Another way to think of it is in a metaphorical example, you think about painting the Mona Lisa. And in this example, I'll just ask if somebody wants to put it in the chat, see if I can bring up chat here. Here we go. Um, so feel free to unmute yourself if you like, or if you'd rather just put it in the chat, you can do that too. But what do we have, what is needed in order to get started with an incremental approach? If you look at this, at this picture here with this example, what do you need to get started? Idea of present state and idea of uh, future state. Idea of present state and idea of future state. I see lots of people saying ideas. I see a blueprint. A vision. A vision. A design of a finished state. Yeah, so Joe, you really nailed, you nailed the, and yeah, Amarada, a final vision. Yeah. Uh, so that's exactly what's needed in this example, right? So if this person were to want the Mona Lisa painted, they really have the end product in mind of what they want. And then in each stage, you're really just, just like in the brick wall example, you're putting a brick into the wall. So the first phase that you're doing is just the face. The second phase would be, would be the right side of the torso. And then you're going to finish up with the left side of the torso. Is anybody, did anybody used to, or, would admit to still doing color by numbers. You know what I'm talking about? Where you have the picture and it's all has broken up into all the different pieces and you color based on the numbers. Like number one is blue, number two is red. And you do that. So that's really an incremental approach if you think about it. Somebody had an end result in mind and they put it together and then they went forward and said, okay, now I'm going to put the color by numbers and 
tell people step by step what they need to do to to color the picture in. So that's really a, an idea of an of an incremental approach. So how is that different from an iterative approach? So with an iterative approach, you're moving from a vague idea into mm -hmm. some some finished state or some realization that you're looking at. So you're delivering work frequently um, mm -hmm. rather than all at once. That's a similarity between an, um, an incremental approach, but you're iterating, you're going to build a rough version, you're going to validate it, and then you're going to fine tune it. So that's like the cycle that you're going to get into. Build it, validate it, tune it. Build, validate, tune. That's the the cadence that you're going through. So you're really building it in advance, knowing that you're going to change it, right? Which is a little bit different from an incremental approach where you're really building that section and you know that that section is exactly right. So you're going to build it right the first time. An iterative approach, you're building it expecting to change it because you're going from rough to detail. If we go back to our Mona Lisa example, a little bit different here what do you need to get started using an iterative approach if you were going to paint the Mona Lisa what would you say sketch what was that a sketch a sketch maybe maybe a sketch but even before the sketch what do you need just well, enough to get an started idea, right? An idea, an idea that, yeah, I see lots of people saying, Jamie says a product goal, a starting point, an idea in mind. So yeah, you're just starting with something really rough, just a rough idea, something that you can do quickly, right? I want a painting of a woman in a pastoral setting, go, right? And then the first phase is, okay, well, I'm just going to do a really quick sketch and then validate, is this what you're looking for? And maybe the answer is yes, but maybe the answer is, you know, now that you put that sketch together, I really had in mind something in landscape, not in portrait. It looks a little bit different than what I had envisioned in my mind. Or maybe, you know, I said a pastoral setting, but now that I see this, I'd really rather have a coastal setting. I really see rather see some water in the background instead of instead of pastures. So again, you're trying to very quickly get some rough idea up front and validate it and then make changes just like we said you're building it expecting to change so in this example you build a sketch the sketch looks okay so you move forward to the second phase and you say well i'm going to build in just a little bit more detail i'm going to add some colors hey how does this look does this look okay yeah i was really expecting a person with dark hair maybe with some light skin and those are the colors that i'm looking for in the background but you know maybe the skin is a little bit lighter than i was expecting I was wanting somebody with a Mediterranean background. Could you have a little bit darker skin for me? So then you valid, you did the validation and you move forward and that's enough to finish up. Actually, interesting. I'm finding interesting that you brought Mandalisa as an example because she happens to be a perfect example because Leonardo repainted this painting several times. Mm. <laughs> including when he was uh, traveling to France, it was ruined by rain. So he had to repaint it right on the way there so mm. yeah it's a good example thank you that's a really good insight i'm glad you shared that yeah all right so poll time again let me start let me do our presentation there we go so pull out your phones scan that qr code or either you're still at menti.com you can just use the new code there i think jamie said she was going to Post some information in the chat to make it easier to, for you if you need to, but it should be pretty easy with this. Um, I think you'll have to reshare it again because I see the thumbs up screen. You can see the same question. You see the same question. Okay. Se second what? question. So advanced. You just have to advance your slide deck there, Mark. Just hit that advance. Arrow. Okay. Oh. So does everybody see iterative or incremental now? Yes. yes. Okay. So if you had to choose a default, what would you choose? Would you choose iterative or incremental? And I know we've got Agilist in here and Agilist will say, well, Mark, it depends. I get it. But 
if you had to say more times than not, which one would you choose? Which one would you would you pick? Iterative or incremental? Ooh. So men showing the same question. Okay. Looks like not sure if we have some uh, biases going on of questions, but iterative is running away with the with the poll here. Poor little incrementals, like half of what iteratives are. I hope I'm not creating a war between two sides by doing this. So it looks like most people are twice as many people prefer iterative over incremental. It's interesting to think. So why is that? Maybe somebody that voted for iterative, why would you say that? What 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 swayed you? You can make changes, uh, look at what you want, and uh, yeah, make changes. That's what I like. Make you have a feedback loop, so you know you're building the right thing. So that's maybe the strongest plus for that. And how about from the incremental crowd? Let's hear from y'all. What did you like best about incremental? Unfortunately, a lot of products that we build uh, cannot use vertical slices. So we have to do it incrementally, brick by brick. Mm. The best way to eat an elephant is a bite at a time. A bite at a time. A wise man once told me that that's how you eat an elephant, but I've never tried it. Well, I'm here to tell you, Jamie, you spoiled the, the suspense here, but there is another option, y'all, and it's iterative and incremental together. So you can have some backlog items that, um, and hold on a second. Let me end the poll here and go back and yeah you have to have it for effect there is another option there you go it's iterative and incremental so you can have some backlog items that are adding new functionality incrementally but then you can also have other backlog items that are iterating so you're um you're iterating on the existing functionality to make it better remember the the where we're building something expecting to change it and you're going to validate it, and then you're going to improve it. You can stop at any point, and you can throw away what you've done, or you can launch it, or I would say you can improve it, right? So this gives us some flexibility that the teams need to build less and validate what they've done to make sure that they're on the right track. So you're eliminating, or at least maybe not eliminating, but you're limiting the waste but you're also giving them something else. You're giving them the ability to be able to innovate all along the way because you're building smaller pieces. You really don't have as much risk to throw away so they can innovate more. Well, let's go back to our Mona Lisa example and look at it from the lens of iterative and incremental. So in this phase or in this approach, person does start with a general vague idea of, hey, well, I want a woman painted and I want her, I want her in a pastoral setting. And I would argue that with this, with this that you see here with these six different steps or phases, whatever you would call them, that you could add another one at the beginning and you could add a sketch. And so you do just enough work for the sketch and hopefully the sketch comes in really fast and you can, like we said before, do you want it landscape? Do you want it portrait? Do you want a pastoral setting? Do you want a coastal setting? And you're limiting the work that you might have to throw away. And if it is what you're looking for, then you can say, okay, well, let's, now that we have the sketch, let's add a little bit of detail to just the face and let's validate it. And the feedback may be, yes, that's what I'm looking for, or no, I want to change it. I wanted some wanted someone with darker skin. I wanted someone with shorter hair. I wanted someone with blonde hair. It could be whatever. And then eventually you get to the second step and you have just the face that's drawn. And what's great about that is 
you get to make a judgment call and say, hey, is this something that we could that we could use? And maybe just that picture of the face is good enough. And we could say, hey, we could actually market that. We could sell that. So let's just sell the face and see if we do some market research. And is that, are we really getting value from that? And if it is, then, hey, yes, we're getting good feedback. We're getting requests for more more pictures, then you say, okay, well, let's fill in a little more detail on the torso and so on and so on and so on. So I don't want to keep going through this example, but I hope you see how you can mix both of these approaches to have the best of both worlds. Now, what's probably on the top of everybody's mind is this is great to give me these metaphorical, these theoretical examples, but I want something a little more concrete, something that is more real world. So I'm going to give that to you too. And I know this is difficult to see, and I'm going to try to zoom in on it here in just a second, but I stole this from Mary Igbal of Rebel Scrum. She had a great article on iterative and incremental development. And so this is a, a an online application. And you see there's two different approaches that are here. The first one is an, an iterative delivery, and the bottom one is a traditional delivery. We would call that waterfall. And hopefully not many of you are are uh, stuck in a in a pure waterfall manner but if you are hey it's okay there's there's time to change and you can improve but back in when i started developing and we were doing waterfall what we would do is we would have this huge application and i've said this before is we need a database to house all the data right and until we get this database done we're not going to write a single line of code so if this application had 5,000 fields, we're going to go through all the work to define and create all 5,000 fields in the database before we do any code, right? That's the waterfall approach. And then after you get the database, you say, okay, now we're going to create a, an API or a data access layer that is able to create, read, update, and delete every field that's in the database. And it takes time to build that, right? Because we're talking 5,000 fields. That's a lot. So it's a lot of work that has to be done. And then finally, now that you have the database and you're able to read, write, and update and delete from it, now you can create the front end that actually interacts with that. So you're hooking that up. Well, we don't typically do things that way now, at least for large applications. Hopefully we've learned to do to break things up better, but let's see if I can zoom in here and let's see how good this works. There we go. So in the iterative, iterative delivery up at the top section there, you see this broken out where you have just a simple little form, web form, and it's got four fields on it. It's got your name and address information. So you should be able to build that really quick, right? You build a little form that's got four fields on it and you have a database and the database really only needs those four fields contained into it. And then to be able to read, write, update, and delete those, you should be able to put some sort of an interface together to hook that up. So you should be able to do that very quickly. And then once you've completed that, then you can move on to the, to the second phase, second iterate, second iteration, second sprint, um, that's listed here, and you could add in some demographic information of city, state, zip, and country code and build that in. So if you were using an iterative and an incremental approach in Sprint 1, maybe we just put those fields on the form and it looks really ugly. It's just a straight list of fields. Don't really care about any styling or anything. Just put them out there and just make it work. And then in the second sprint, we could come back and say, okay, let's add a few more fields, but let's also do some styling as well. Let's style those fields so that we have them grouped together. We have them looking very nice. Maybe they're using a certain font that, that uh, the customer would like. Um, we have some nice interaction qualities of the field so that they look really nice and feel really nice uh, to the user. And then you keep going through step three, step four, and step five. So you see we're continually incrementing and we're iterating in order to get to get to an end goal. All right. So I'm going to try to zoom out. <laughs> keep that up. All right. And 
what I want to do is I want to try to help your teams to utilize both an iterative and an incremental approach if they so desire to do. And the way I want to do that is not with providing you with this big hammer so that you can hammer teams into submission. I want to offer you some questions, just simple questions that you can use to ask the team to get them to reflect and maybe just slightly steer the ship in a little bit different direction. So if you ever hear teams saying when they're discussing, maybe during backlog refinement, maybe during planning, and they're discussing either user stories or technical stories, and you keep hearing, what if, what about, how are we going to handle, you're starting to hear all these questions. Maybe you can just pause and say, well, hey, y'all, what's the, what's just the simplest solution that we can, that we can implement and get some feedback on? All these edge cases that keep getting brought up, those are good to have, but could we defer those until later? Is there something that we could do that's very simple now and then iterate on it, iterate on it later? So that's a way to steer the ship. Another way is to ask them about researching. Maybe instead of researching, how can we create something of value instead of researching? All right, show of hands. You can either do it most people are off camera, but if you want to do it virtually, if you want to raise your virtual hand, how many people have heard developers been in the situation where before they actually get started with anything, they want to create a research spike? All right, I start seeing hands go up. And not just one research spike, but multiple spikes. And before you know it, it's like, wow, we spent two sprints on research spikes. When are we going to get, oh, well, we did it. The work's already done. We did it as part of the research spike. And inside you're just like, <laughs> wow, I wish, how could we have broken this out different? So instead of resorting to just creating these research spikes to get all of the answers that we need, how can we actually create something of value and validate that to get some feedback? Because if we spend lots of time researching, and then we implement before we get to learn, then we could be introducing waste into the picture, right? So that's another question that, that you can ask. Uh, a little bit different way that you could phrase it is how can we make small bets instead of large ones? So I think everybody likes, would prefer to make a small bet just in case you're wrong um, to eliminate your, or to reduce the amount of money that you lose. So if you have lots of small bets that have higher probability of winning versus one large bet that has a smaller probability of, of, of winning, but you have a bigger payout, that's a lot riskier, right? So hopefully everybody would say, would agree with you that, yeah, I would rather break this up into many smaller bets as opposed to putting all our eggs in one big basket and banking on that it's true. Because yeah, you could say, I want to paint the Mona Lisa, picture done give us six months and we'll deliver you a picture well what if that picture's wrong then you've wasted a lot of time building the picture that you put into that one big bet you can also ask can we show something done at sprint review or maybe if you're brave what will we show at sprint review it's another way to turn the conversation and get people to think differently instead of, well, I just need to do all this background work first. I need to do the framework work first, and then I'm just going to hook it all up together. Well, what can we show that's been done? And I'm not talking about bringing up your IDE and, and showing people code or explaining, well, hey, I've created 12 different components and now I'm going to wire them up in the next. Well, what can we actually show that's working at Sprint Review so that we actually build some confidence in, in our stakeholders and what we're building. So thinking about time, what's the fastest way to ensure that this is going to work, right? How can we build that sketch really quick before we get started to validate and make sure that we're going to, that we're going on the right path and we don't need to switch from a, from a portrait to a landscape view that we don't need to, to change from a person with long hair to short hair, right? And finally, what risk is introduced by postponing integration? 
I've faced this many times is that integration is the hard part when you're integrating multiple pieces, especially when you're talking about third party, uh, third parties and vendors. And many times it's like, well, we'll just put that off until like, we just need to put the building blocks together and then we're just going to hook it all up and it's going to work. But how can we reduce our risk by not postponing that integration? So I want to pause and ask which of these resonate with anybody or which of these do you find interesting and feel free to put it in the chat or if you want to come on, come off of mute and just speak, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I like the one about, um, the challenge of what would we be able to show in the sprint review? That's something that I use a lot. Um, you know, how do we show progress? How do we show our stakeholders we're, we're working towards the solution that's going to ease their pain points? So it's a lot easier way than trying to use the big hammer of we have to get to done. The sprint right. guide says we have to have a usable increment at the end of the sprint. So how are we going to get there? It's a little easier way to, to convince people, right? Yep. Looking at that short-term goal of progress. The, the second one has backfired sometimes if you put it in exact those words about, because they want it to be in their head. And I've been a software engineer myself, and now I'm a product owner, so I can understand the need for research before committing to something or estimating something. And and if we ask it in this way, it'll just seem like we don't understand the importance of research that they need to do uh, to finish their uh, what we're asking them to do. So um, it just like has backfired when I asked in this way, instead of researching or how can we create value? Because in, in, their, in their minds, it's like, you need the research to create value, obviously, like this person doesn't understand the process at all, <laughs> you know? So uh, everything else I have used um, successfully, but that one just a li little wary about. So that's interesting, yeah. Yeah. So yes, as we said, it depends, right? It depends, but with the researching, what we're really after here is, I guess I would say big researching, right? If you want to do a little research to make sure that you're on the right path, my take would be, yeah, that's okay. But if you want to research for multiple weeks, multiple sprints, I would ask is that how can we build that research into something that we can validate? Because yeah, typically with researching, you're not analysis, validating. Of, uh, analysis phase. Right. So I've, I've been, instead of just saying that that has backfired, let me also add what has worked mm -hmm. instead was to, to talk about research in a way that, that like, uh, you talk in, in 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 science or in academics right? and be like, what is, uh, so let's take each of these spikes and let's not leave it open-ended into like, I'm just going to research how to do this. Whereas let's uh, come up with, what's your hypothesis? What do you want to test? Give me like one sentence that will then be true or false. And that's when we know this spike ends, right? Like, like write out what your hypothesis is. And that has usually been more uh, relatable to engineers and data scientists because that's more that language. Uh, we might mean the same thing in, when we say it, but it just lands differently when you put it like that, I think. So Ankita, that's a great call out. So I really appreciate that very much because yes open-ended research quite frequently ends in ongoing continuous research but if we're defining exactly what are what are our expectations what's our hypothesis for this that helps to put some parameters and we're focusing on exactly what questions we need answered not well i just need to kind of play with this for enough time until it's done so i i appreciate you sharing that and that's a great call out to to 
kind of binding your research or limiting your research, maybe not in not eliminating it. So that's something that I could I could use to update this. So thank you very much for that. All right. Well, for the sake of time, I want to move forward and give you not one, but two sets of questions, y'all. Two for the price of one. How about that? All right. How can we avoid or reduce waiting? So how many of you have heard from your development teams? Well, there's nothing that we can do until we wait on the designers, until we wait on the vendor to complete their piece. So we just kind of have to sit and wait. And until that piece is done, we can't get started. And that might be true. That might be true. But let me give you some examples. So with the in the designer cases, you know, is there any way for us to begin the UI while we're waiting for design to complete? Can we just throw fields on a screen, just no styling whatsoever? And then once the designs come in, we can actually go through and create that user experience and we can style things later. That gets us, at least gets us to doing something while we're waiting and not just sitting and waiting for someone else, right? It makes us much more proactive. <laughs> gotcha, Charlene. She liked my comment. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> so I get a different point of view because my teens are all back in. So my point of view that I get, or let me say feedback for my teams. I'm sorry, I'm not on camera, Emma. I'm sorry. Hey, Mark. Um, <clears throat> is that one of the things I do is uh, I make sure that I set up some uh, design sessions or some sort of technical discussion. And we time box them and we give them, uh, you know, hold them accountable to we need a, an answer by X to keep on schedule so that we can deliver. So uh, that kind of forces, let's say, the groups outside of my sprint team, for example, architects, we have no UI. So architects, more of a technical discussion, maybe some DBAs, you know, whatever we need, we get them in. Um, we basically make sure that we get what we need from them and then move forward with uh, the team has spikes. This is what my teams do. They have spikes and the spikes are pointed. And the outcome of the spike is you've got to have some sort of evidentiary proof documentation, something with a um, uh, with a like more of a acceptance criteria for to getting it. What should it look like? Um, and then when the stories will be created from the spike, that's a given. The stories go through refinement. We go from there. So that's kind of what my teams do. It may be a little different from others. Um, some people create technical enablers, um, more of like enabler type epics or stories. But we just basically try to keep that um, information like out of JIRA too much till we get that understand what has to be done right and get those decisions made yeah 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 that's yeah. good yeah it, time boxes are are quite effective so i like that i like that approach as well yeah you have to do time boxes when you work with depending on other lines of business mm -hmm. and teams if you don't it, it will you'll feel ran over yep, <laughs> yep. or you'll be waiting forever <laughs> exactly yeah. So maybe it's not just the UI that you're talking about. Maybe it's mm -hmm. some some either middleware or back end that you're talking about. Well, you could ask, well, could we use mocking to yeah. for our dependencies mm -hmm. until we get those resolved? You know, hopefully if you're working with an API, you've got contracts built which say for each of your method calls, you know, what mm -hmm. inputs am I taking? What outputs am I expecting? Well, can we mock those? until we get the real implementation, because you should be able to put together at least that boilerplate version of your, of your API together so right. that the team can mock and move forward. And it That's looks like not always getting... the case, depending upon the data you need. Sometimes we have to make um, some sort of adjustment, like copy of what's in production or another environment. Mm -hmm. But um, I definitely include these as impediments on my sprint review reports. That's good. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to motor through the rest of these. It's just a couple more. Actually, it's just one more because we're running short on time. But and this one's a little bit, I'm going back to my developer days, but you could ask, is the, could the factory pattern be used? And I'm going to explain this with an example that I had. And 
And so we had a project that I was working on in the past where we were working with a third party and working on a vendor and they were sending us some data in a specific format. It was called JSON and the team was stuck waiting. And this vendor had many customers that they were trying to, they were trying to satisfy. So we weren't at the top of their stack. So we were waiting, waiting, waiting and going to wait for a while. So finally somebody stood up and said, you know what? I can build an interface with just a straight text file, like in a couple of hours. And as long as we know the data that's going to be in that text file, we can parse it. And then the really hard stuff that we need to do, all those business rules that come after reading the data in, that's what we need to focus on. So let's just build this really quick to stand it up so that we can get to the hard parts later. And what they did was they used a factory pattern because what that allowed them to do is that when the real format came in from the vendor, they were able to very quickly be able to not have to remove all the logic that was built into the text file because maybe that was something they could use later. And guess what? Maybe something else would come later that was bigger and better than JSON and they didn't want to have to do major surgery to cut this big piece out and then put a new piece in with the factory pattern. They were able to just have multiple different inputs in very elegantly integrate that into the into the code so in that case they were able to continue moving without having to wait all right up against the wire here so as we're at the end i would say i've given you many reasons um, to use iterative and incremental reduce risk you're getting value sooner you're giving developers more flexibility but i would say i would argue that the greatest reason would be is that working software is really the primary measure of progress. So this obviously comes from the Agile Manifesto and the visibility that you create, I would say is the highest value. All right, so that's it. I appreciate everybody. I appreciate you sharing. It really means a lot that you took the time not only to show up here, but you also uh, were able to discuss with me. If you want to connect with me, uh, do so on LinkedIn. I'm on it all the time. So be sure and connect with me there and love to have you join my, listen to my podcast, The Agile Within. So there's a link there. All right. I'll leave that up for just a second, but again, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back over to Anu and Jamie. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.